and I apologize that you have to um, listen to me ramble on, but I'm going to make it short. And I may even change my mind about that because of Billy Bob. <laughs> you know, Rusty mentioned that this might be a sermonette, but I may turn it into a sermon just for Billy Bob. Okay. And you know what? As I'm thinking about it, one of the scriptures that we're going to use, we're going to look at today, talks about opening your eyes. And that's, I think that scripture was meant for Roy. Open your eyes. <laughs> Open your eyes. <laughs> okay. All right. So we've had some fun, so let's get going. So this morning I'm going to be talking about good news to the poor. So why did Jesus, why do you think it is that Jesus mentioned that he wanted, he wanted his followers to be poor in spirit? He wanted them to be meek. Well, it's because of pride, pride in our lives. Pride gets in the way of everything we do. And guess what? We can't come to God and be proud. And you know, we all think we're smart. We got everything figured out. That's been the biggest obstacle in my life is because I think I know how to do everything. I think I know everything. Well, we can't find our way back to God on our own smarts, on our own good looks, on any of that stuff. But we have to find out what God is going to do to bring us back in unison with him. In Luke chapter 4, 16 through 21, it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set a li at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And you know everybody was looking at him, thinking, who is this guy, and who does he think he is? And the, all, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let's pray. Father, we know that the words that you have sent, the words that you have written, the truths that you have put in our hearts, we know that they are all inspired from your very heart. We believe in you. We trust in you. And Lord, we thank you today that you sent the word himself, Jesus, the Savior, King, our brother, and our mentor, to bring us back into unison with you. And Lord, we know that there was a great sacrifice that happened at the cross, Lord. But we know that the cross was the center of everything that you had planned for us. And Lord, help us to listen, to sit at the feet of Jesus, and to understand the word that he's brought to us, the message of the good news of the Savior of the world. Help us, Lord, to take that into ourselves, to put it into our spirit. Lord, to, to, to be meek at the feet of Jesus be poor in spirit that we might consume the glory of God through Jesus and his word. Help us that the good news would be good news to us today, that we would take it into our lives and let it be seen by the way we live. Bless us today, Lord, and help these words to inspire us, to encourage us for better things and the glory of God. In his name we pray. Amen. So, I'm going to read a couple more verses out of Isaiah. So, <clears throat> we just read verse 1, but we're going to read Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 3. 
and I think only one is on your slide. But let's read. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the eyes, opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you know, in Christ, every year is a year of, Lord, of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to com comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So, wait a minute. We just read something right there that is pretty interesting. So, Jesus came to bring the good news. Jesus came for the poor in spirit. He came to open our eyes. He came that we would have hope. He came that we would have gladness. He claimed that we would. He came that we would not mourn. He said, instead of a faint spirit, instead of a faint spirit, he goes, he's going to bring up a spirit of hope. That's all found in the gospel, okay? But when we look at the gospel, we just think it's a simple phrase. Oh, Jesus came and he, you know, and he, uh, he died for us. And we believe that. It's not simple. It's a deep faith. But he also came to do a whole bunch of abundant things that change our lives eternally, that give us true meaning that change us. We can't earn that in this world. We can't find that at, on our jobs. We can't learn that in, in books. We can't get that from having a high standing in the community. But we can get all that thing, all those things and more and free in the gospel and in, the, in our faith in Jesus Christ. So the Spirit of Lord, he, Spirit of the Lord, he said, is upon me. And he came to open our eyes. And he came for the meek in spirit. He came for the poor in spirit. And he came for a specific purpose. At the very end, the last thing it says there at the end of verse 3, that the Lord might be glorified. Jesus didn't even come for himself. He came that the Lord might be glorified. You know, and so today we're talking about Three things, three reasons the good news is really good news. First of all, because God sent it. Number two, the good news gives us freedom. And number three, you have been anointed by God. Well, that's interesting because we just read that Jesus was anointed. anointed. But you have been anointed by God as well. So number one, God sent it. And Rusty's going to read from us for us something here from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend. Amen. Thank you, Rusty. So what did Jesus say when he was offered bread and tempted by the devil? Remember what he said? Well, the whole point is that Satan tempted Jesus with glory. See, I think, I think it's a common temptation that we share. You know, in the things that we do and accomplishing accomplishments in our lives, you know, those things can lead to pride. So Satan was tempting Jesus with glory. But guess what? Jesus didn't need that glory. He came from heaven. He came from the presence of the Father. But he came down here in a lowly world and took on flesh, and he gave up that glory momentarily. He momentarily gave up the glory of God 
that he could accomplish what God sent him to do. He came to bring the good news, and he came to bring mankind back into unison with the very God that he left in heaven. And see, so what we also read there in John is that he came, he was the word. Not only was he the word, but he brought us the truth of the gospel. And so God said it, God sent it, and that's it. Jesus said he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And Jesus came to glorify God. Rusty, would you read Luke 5, 26? They glorified God because of Jesus. They glorified God because of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to bring glory to himself. He came to bring glory to the Father. So number two, the good news gives us freedom. In America, we, we think we have freedom to do anything. And we do have a lot of freedom in this world. And God gave us that. And he gave us the government. And he gave us freedom to choose. But he also put a place in our hearts that none of that stuff can fill. He put a place in our hearts that only God himself can feel. And Jesus came to make a way for that. So there is liberty and there is freedom in Christ. And let's see what Paul said uh, to the people of Athens. Paul addresses the Areopagus in Athens, verses 17, 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, he has made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the, bounding, the boundaries of their dwelling, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. He gave us the right to seek him out, but then he sent Christ to make sure that it was easy. He gave us a right to seek him out. I think God put a place in our hearts, and I, I say this every chance I hear. I think God put a place in our hearts that only he can fill. And then he sent Jesus out there he, to remind us. Jesus came to remind us that God is the way, and he is the way to God, that God is the, is the end result, and Jesus is the way to God. In Hebrews 11, let's see, Hebrews 11 mentions that. Let's see. Hebrews 11, 6, this is what it says. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whosoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he, that he rewards those who seek him. And so faith comes through the gospel, the word of the gospel, and that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to bring us that gospel whereby we may find our faith in God. And through that gospel message, we find our faith in God. Faith in God. And what, what Paul was telling these people in Athens is that that unknown God that you're, you're, you're sitting here contemplating about, these people in Athens, they were smart. I mean, they sit around and they, in their minds, solved all the world's greatest problems. But they didn't know who this unknown God was. 
And, and, and Paul was telling them here, wait a minute, this unknown God, now you guys know everything. He says, I see that you're smart and maybe even religious. But in, 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 a, in a strange way, I think he was actually kind of making fun at them, of them. Because, but y'all don't know who this unknown God is? He says, I submit to you that it might be the God of heaven, that it might be the God, this unknown God. And if you seek him out, he's going he's gonna to reach out to you. If you seek him out, you diligently seek him out, and you, and you trust him, and you hear the gospel, and you learn to have faith in him, he's going to make a way for you to enter your heart through your faith and through your belief in him. And it says, it, 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 the, the scripture ends, yet he is actually not far from each of us. He's not far from any of us. So number three, you've been anointed by God. Now we read, we read, Jesus said himself in Isaiah 61 that he's been anointed. He's been anointed. Well, what about us? What do you mean anointed? Well, what does anointed mean anyway? Well, I mean, there's several, there's several directions you can go when you're talking about anointed. Anointed can also can mean to, to put oil on, okay? But it's got some other meanings. Uh, it means dedicated to God. It means consecrated for God. It means set apart to serve God. And we know that Jesus was all of those things. But guess what? What does Matthew 28 say? This is about us. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, does that mean that we are set apart? Does that mean that we're called? Does that mean that we're consecrated for a mission? Well, I'll tell you that I think we're consecrated for the mission of the gospel. We're, con we're set apart to serve God and bring people to the knowledge of the truth. Now, now I'm gonna, I submit to you that we're not, it's not our job to get people to heaven. I think that's a mistake when we, we think that. It isn't our mission to get people to heaven. It's our mission to get people to Jesus. You know, we're not in the church business. We're in the Jesus business. So I'd, I'm not going to waste any time trying to get people to heaven. It's, that's God's job. Jesus came to do that. He came to bring people in unison with God. I'm just a servant. I just have a small thing to do. Jesus did all the hard stuff. Listen, you don't have to put no pressure on yourself. We got the easy stuff. Jesus did the hard stuff. So we're not here to try to get people to heaven. We're here to try to get people to Jesus. That's what it's all about. It's not about us. It isn't about us at all. But we have been set apart. We have been anointed for the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have been consecrated for the mission of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. We have been dedicated to God's service for the mission of the good news of Jesus Christ. So in light of all of this, what should we do? What then should we do? Because sin and doubt has crept into the world and we got, we're got we surrounded by people that don't acknowledge God. They don't even acknowledge truth. There are people that don't. You can't tell them that there is truth about anything. There is not a single truth about literally anything you bring up, let alone religious truths, biblical truths. So we were lost. We found ourselves in the middle of this world. We were lost without hope. We were full of ourselves and without God. And then Jesus came and brought the good news. The world has a choice, just like, just like Paul said in Athens. The world has a choice. To believe that we're on our mission to get people to Jesus. But the world has a choice to believe or not to believe. To trust or not to be trust. But I say to you, we have to reach out to those people in love, 
and patience and with grace and all the things that God did for us. Do you remember when, when Jesus was walking through the city and Zacchaeus was up in the tree? You know, Jesus could have just said, just ignored him or said something rude. But he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to go eat with you today. So that's the way that we have to reach out to people. We have to be like Jesus. We have to have the grace and the humility and the love and the, and the spirit that Jesus had. When he, and J, Jesus spent his time eating with the people that needed him, teaching the people that needed him, while the others were conspiring to kill him. So we have to be that good news to the people and the world around us. And we just read that Jesus sent us to do that. Jesus came and brought good news. The good news really is good news. Well, that's our message for today. If there's anything that the church can do for you, we want you to come as we sing, sing and uh, have a song of encouragement. We want you to think about what God has done in your life, how he's used you. If he hasn't used you in the ways that, in the ways that you think that maybe he should have, that might be because of you. It may be because you haven't, you haven't opened your eyes to what God can do through you. So I say today, open your eyes. Open your eyes. And let God do the work. Why don't you come and stand as we sing? Since the name of the Savior is precious to you,